I'm delighted to be able to talk today to Professor Gwen Lowry. He's been one of the most important African-American intellectuals in America now for some four decades. From working class beginnings, he eventually rose to become a professor at Harvard University at the age of just 33, which tells a powerful story in itself. He's now at Brown University. He's written groundbreaking essays and several standard books, including the classic, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality. The New York Times wrote a feature piece on Professor Lowry in 2002 and described his views as, I quote, fiercely independent and unclassifiable. Professor Lowry continues to weigh in on debates raging today uh, regarding Black Lives Matter, systemic racism, and indeed reparations to African Americans. So Glenn, can I begin by asking about your personal journey, your intellectual journey, in coming to grips with the nature of race relations in America? Well, um, I uh, was born on the south side of Chicago in a working class African American community, educated in public schools there. And after uh, I started college, which didn't end well, um, my girlfriend, uh, my, uh, we married early, baby's coming along, I dropped out. I ultimately found my way back to the university, completed at the age of 23 from Northwestern University with mathematics, and then went on to MIT and did a PhD in economics. Um, I was a conventional, in those years, this is the 1970s, I was a conventional um, liberal uh, uh, microeconomist uh, interested in inequality issues, to be sure, but many other issues besides. But being black, living here in America, one couldn't really escape uh, being engaged with the debates about discrimination and disparities and racial inequality. And so I found myself drawn into that conversation. But early on, uh, and I won't go on too long about this, John, but I'll just say early on, I felt some discomfort with the standard narrative. The standard narrative, uh, 15 years after the end of the civil rights movement, as I was beginning my career, when I began to uh, teach at Harvard in the early 1980s, was that African Americans lag behind because whites won't extend opportunity to us. Doors are shut. We don't have the fair chance to show our human talent. And I began to think that while there certainly were problems, that they were increasingly uh, to be found within the African-American community itself. And I say this with trepidation. I say it cautiously uh, because it's very easy to slip into a kind of uh, blaming of the victim for all of his or her problems. But I looked at the condition of the African-American family. I looked at the level of criminal violence in black communities. I looked at the extent of, um, of uh, disparity in uh, educational achievement, uh, at behavioral problems, at uh, adolescents acting out, um, at, at a low attachment to work, at a heavy dependence upon welfare. And I said, you know, if we want genuine equality, it's not enough to petition the society to end discrimination. That, of course, is necessary but not sufficient. We also have to examine the enemy within. The enemy without and the enemy within, that was my formulation. The enemy without being white racism, the enemy within being patterns of behavior amongst us uh, in some parts of African-American society that impeded our ability to take advantage of opportunities. Um, that uh, deviation from the standard narrative cost me a lot in terms of, of friends and uh, supporting the black community and so forth, but I, I don't mean to make myself into a martyr. I just mean to say it's difficult terrain when one takes on that kind of dissident or contrarian view. Um, I found myself uh, being attracted by some of what I was hear hearing on the conservative side of the political divide here in America, and I was willing to identify with it. I'll stop because we don't have an unlimited amount of time, but out of that beginning, I have come to engage the questions that continue to uh, drive uh, a lot of the political discussion around race here from the point of view of saying, yes, there is racism, but there are also many serious problems within the community and we must take responsibility for raising our children 
and for seizing the opportunities that exist, as many millions of immigrants, many of whom come from non-European points of origin, have been doing over the last uh, half century here in the United States. Well, there are certainly echoes of that in Australia, and I think some of our best thinkers here would say the worst mistake you can make is to remove agency from, 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 from Indigenous people in our country by, by patronising and saying it's all our fault. That disparity may be the result of discrimination, but it isn't necessarily the result, the result of discrimination. Is that, is that in part what you're saying? It is. Um, the removal of agency is a, a deep concern of mine. Uh, the tone of the conversation here in the U.S. in the last 10 years uh, has very much shifted in that direction of, um, you know, the evocation of notions of systemic racism and white supremacy and uh, so on as the determinant of the outcomes for African Americans and the citing of historical uh, effects like the legacy of enslavement and of Jim Crow segregation carrying on through the 20, middle of the 20th century, as if those facts alone determine the outcome in the schools and in the neighborhoods and in the prisons of America in the year 2020. Uh, black people on this argument can do nothing but petition white people to deliver equality to us. And I think that that is a, is a bogus argument, that at the end of the day, that's an argument of surrender, and it leaves one, uh, oddly, petitioning the putative oppressor to save you from the consequences of, uh, of his oppression. Uh, that's a non sequitur in my mind. That's a very valuable insight and, and, and beautifully put. Um, it, it, it has to be said that there are many, many good people uh, supporting the BLM protests, uh, including, I would imagine, many, many very fine African Americans. But uh, it does seem that uh, it's been hijacked in many ways. BLM itself seems to promote some ideas which are hardly designed to build respect for one another. Um, but nonetheless, how would you see, what would you say is legitimate about what the protest movements are saying? I've seen you right. I mean, obviously what happened in the case of George Floyd was absolutely horrendous. But as we know um, uh, from the work done in America now, there are a significant number, perhaps 50 or 60 a year, although that's not so many in the population of America, be, you know, it's a very big country, of people who are killed each year, unarmed people killed by the police. Um, but they're by no means um, all African Americans at all. Well, <laughs> I like to tell people when we talk about this that they have to remember the United States is a country of 330 million people. We are a continental nation, as are you, uh, but our continent is a little bit bigger. Uh, they're, they're sprawling all over dozens and dozens of cities, of urban areas of concentrated population, which are uh, racially heterogeneous. There are tens of thousands of encounters between police officers and American citizens on a daily basis. About 1,200 Americans are killed by police officers in a year, of which maybe 300 are African American. That means that most of the people killed by police officers are not African American, and the majority of people killed by police officers in the United States are white. For every instance like the George Floyd knee on the neck incident, um, or the Tamir Rice kid with a toy gun shot in a park incident, or the Eric Gardner um, uh, miscreant selling uh, illegal cigarettes outside of a convenience store, encountering the police and choked until he died incident. There are whites who have died in exactly the same manner, but we don't hear about these stories because they are not salient. They don't get reported in the press. So we're a big country. And the incidents that we're talking about, which are sometimes deeply disturbing, are relatively rare. And moreover, they're not all defined by the race of the people who are participating in these incidents. So I want to try to keep things in perspective when we talk about this. There are a lot of guns in the country. If you're an American police officer and you have the unfortunate responsibility of having to detain a vehicle that you think might be carrying a dangerous criminal, 
you have to reckon with the possibility that he's, the firearm is in the vehicle and that you're going to be confronting a life and death situation. This does not excuse bad policing. Bad policing needs to be dealt with. Police need to be trained properly. They need to be held accountable when they violate rules of engagement with citizens and so on. There are bad police. There are racist police. But if you have to pull that vehicle over, the, the, the possibility that you might be fired upon by the person who's inside of that is a very real thing in your mind. This is an extremely difficult situation for anybody to be in. So these incidents have happened, but they are not, in my view, representative of the day-to-day -day life experience of African Americans and the extent to which Black Lives Matter and others uh, have, uh, have uh, characterize the circumstances if every African American must fear for his or her life upon stepping from their door, uh, this is a, 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 a gross distortion of the reality here. Yeah, well, I mean, it strikes me as an aside, if I can make this observation, one of the problems, I'm, I'm a former member of parliament, you get the same thing with politicians. If you create such cynicism about people in that profession, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't get the good leaders you want. You don't get the good police you want. It becomes an undesirable place to go. You want good people to go and try and be good police. But if it's going to be assumed simply because they're in a uniform that they're against you and they're a danger, I would have thought that serves no one's interests. I, I just mentioned that as an aside because you... Oh, no, that's, it's exactly right. It's a really important point. Recruiting... Uh, of uh, police officers is suffering very badly from this passage that we're going through right now. Who would want to take on this responsibility? Yeah. You have black police chiefs, and there are dozens of them around the country, who are resigning their responsibilities. They no longer want to be at the head of an organization that's going to be vilified at every turn, and uh, they feel they can't, they're, they're in an impossible situation where they can't uh, responsibly stand up for their duty and be loyal to the people who work under them and at the same time uh, face the community and be accepted with respect. So they're stepping away. Um, it's a serious problem recruiting good police officers. And I would have thought it particularly troubling for um, African-American women who I understand are very likely to be the people, uh, statistically, even most likely to ring police looking for help in a, in a violent or dangerous situation. How does it serve their interests? As the uh, uh, former basketball player Charles Barkley, who comments on television about sporting events, has said recently, who are black people supposed to call? Ghostbusters? <laughs> yeah. well, I hope that rings a bell in Australia because the movie was really quite, quite big here in the United States. Yeah. Who are we going to call? Ghostbusters? I yeah. mean, the, the de-policing movement... <laughs> yeah does not have the endorsement of the rank and file yeah. in the black community. I can assure you of that. There are many, many instances of people speaking out against it because they have to live on a daily basis with the consequences of the violent behavior of a relatively few uh, who are in their midst. Those of us with resources move away from communities that have these kind of problems. It's poor people who are left behind to deal with the consequences of this behavior. To come to another area where it seems to me that, in fact, those people purporting to speak for African-Americans are in fact advocating policies that may in fact may really make things worse. So come to the delicate but important area, I think, of the environment in which young children grow up, particularly our boys. Now, Dr. Warren Farrell, uh, who I've come to know well through these conversations, very astute observer of, of, of what he calls the boy crisis. I mean, 85% of the staggering number of Americans who are in jail are males. Um, so the first thing you've got to face is why is it that men are getting into so much trouble and then you can talk about why so many uh, African-American men are in jail. But uh, he makes the point that something like 75% now of African-Americans have not grown up with their dads and that that is a very powerful predictor of a boy who may end up in trouble on the wrong side of the justice system or indeed in prison uh, or in deep personal strife. We're not apparently meant to talk about these things, the modern narrative, people get very uptight about it. In fact, Black Lives Matter, though, I think they've changed their website now, but initially they made it pretty plain that one of the things they wanted to deconstruct was the so-called nuclear family. How, do, how would that approach? I mean, surely we need to be honest and say one of the predictors, which must lead us to investigate what's happening here, will be the issue of a lack of fathering models, responsible male modelling, 
for young men in general, but particularly for young African men? Well, now you're running up not only with race, but you're running up into the gender uh, brick wall of uh, people saying you're valorizing conventional ways of arranging family affairs and of the raising of children. Why are fathers uh, made central? Um, and you're running into the problem of blaming the victim. This is a very old story going all the way back here in the U.S. to the 1960s. Famously, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late uh, great uh, U.S. senator and uh, public intellectual, uh, called attention to the crisis of the, what he called the Negro family at that time. This is the mid-1960s, pointing out that the out-of-wedlock birth rate was, uh, in those years, 20 percent, 25 percent amongst African Americans, much higher than in the general population, worrying that uh, the uh, absence of fathers in the home, both their paycheck um, and the role that they would play in the raising of children uh, would uh, have uh, bad consequences for the community going forward, uh, arguing, Moynihan did, in the 1960s, in effect, that the gains of the civil rights movement would come to naught at the end of the day if we didn't confront the problem of the so-called Negro family, um, and recommending that uh, extra shifts be laid on at the, the post office and other federal employment in order to create jobs on the theory that the reason that there were low levels of, uh, of uh, children born to intact family was that men uh, were not able to find gainful work. In any case, I say all of that to say, Moynihan was vilified. Uh, he was made into a racist. Uh, President Johnson abandoned the idea of including the discussion of family matters within his larger vision of how to respond to the problem of incorporating, quote, the Negro into the American Commonwealth. And it's been, in effect, in polite company and progressive uh, uh, audiences, taboo to speak about family matters ever since. Things have changed a lot since the mid-1960s. Three out of four babies born to a black woman in this country are born to a woman who is not married. This doesn't have to be a moral indictment to see that the absence of fathers in the home deprives the household of the resources that are needed to provide a stable environment for the raising of children, especially boys. Now, I am not a social worker or a social psychologist. I can't, with professional expertise, address the question of the developmental consequences of father absence in a rigorous way. But it is my impression, having uh, exposed myself to this literature by people who are professionals, that uh, the person you alluded to earlier is correct, and that the absence of fathers is implicated in the uh, development of behavioral problems in male adolescents uh, later on, and that those behavioral problems are present both in their behavior within schools, where the discipline of uh, students is uh, racially disparate in, in very large numbers, and black boys are much more likely to be suspended from school, but is also reflected in uh, behavior later in life in terms of criminal offending and so on. That I can't prove that absent fathers causes criminal offending, but I am persuaded that the development of the African-American family and the disintegration, if you will, of it over the course of these past decades is a part of the reason why we find ourselves in the uh, condition that we do now. Um, no, it's not polite to speak of it, but I think it's an absolutely uh, unavoidable uh, part of the account that one would have to give if you want to understand this, this uh, problem. Yeah, I think for me the problem is that uh, we live in this age where evidence doesn't seem to matter, whereas if we say we're as children of the Enlightenment, then you say you go where the evidence leads you and you can't ignore this elephant in the room. And if you really, really care, if you really care about what you say you care about, I don't know that you can ignore this for the sake of our children. We've got to come to grips with it. You can't simply sweep it under the, column, under the paper. But, but to switch to the positive, my understanding is that since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, when perhaps 30% of African Americans were what you'd call loosely middle class on middle class incomes, there's been a significant lift. There are a lot of African-American families, let's, let's be positive for a moment, who are doing really well and, you know, still find America, well, not still find, that's probably an unfortunate word, but have found in America a, a, a place of freedom and of opportunity uh, and of prosperity. And surely there's a lot of good news as, beside the troubling problems that are raised by the current concerns. 
uh, within my lifetime, at the middle of the 20th century, um, 1950, uh, the modal occupation for African-American men was farm laborer, and the uh, modal op occupation for African-American women was domestic uh, servant, uh, household service. Um, we have, if you look at the penetration of the professions, medicine and law and engineering and uh, the academy, uh, if you look at the um, uh, development of a small business and entrepreneurship, um, if you look at the massive uh, footprint that African-Americans have in entertainment and uh, sports and so on, um, we have billionaires, uh, the Oprah Winfrey's of the world and the LeBron James's of the world and uh, so on like that. Uh, we're the richest, most prosperous people of African descent, some 35 or 40 million strong here on the North American continent. The richest black people on the planet Nigeria has 200 million people and it has about a third of the GDP en masse of as do uh, the household incomes of African Americans taken as a whole who are 35 or 40 million here. Uh, so uh, there's enormous opportunity here. Uh, no, things are, there are disparities. Absolutely, there are disparities. But um, the uh, a number of African Americans who have uh, prospered, who are homeowners, who have accumulated wealth, who have relative comfort, um, um, numbers in the many, many, many millions. Um, so I, I guess it depends on how one wants to look at things. If you look at it in terms of the absolute living standards of people, uh, the curve shows a continuous uh, upward slope. If you ask in terms of the relative standing of people, there are disparities that have persisted and they are a source of concern. Yeah, so as an outsider looking in, um, I'm, I'm also conscious, it seems to me, that vast numbers of white Americans obviously voted for a black president as well. Uh, you know, that, there is that. They, they lifted themselves, no, you know. That, they, that, that is a reflection of the uh, transformation of attitudes and the acceptance of African Americans, a first family occupying the White House, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, their two little children, their dog, uh, they become emblems of the American, uh, of the American project. They, they are the uh, quintessential Americans, uh, these, uh, this family. Uh, loved by many people. Now, they did meet with resistance. One doesn't want to overlook the fact that uh, there are anti-black racists who continue to, uh, you know, speak out and, and uh, have, their, uh, have their voices heard in various quarters here in the United States. Barack Obama met with some resistance because of his race. I think that that's undeniable. Uh, but he was elected twice, the most powerful person on the planet. Um, and uh, had a huge impact on uh, on American society, although, uh, but with uh, the uh, Trump administration's uh, efforts, uh, uh, much of what Obama uh, attempted to accomplish is being undone. Nonetheless, I understand, uh, and I don't have the, the you know the actual figures. I do understand that some uh, African Americans, um, perhaps more than I might have expected, support Trump in the. Uh, in the current rather divided America that we look on and as one who loves America and uh, uh, loves a can-do attitude and the way in which they've stood for freedom in a troubled world. Um, yeah, we, that's true. I, I, I didn't mean to observe. I mean, Trump is appointing judges that Obama would have never appointed. Trump is uh, enacting legislation that Obama would have opposed. I didn't, and that's what I meant when I said much of what Obama was trying to do has been undone. I didn't mean to say, however, that African Americans uh, are um, uh, approach to politics turns entirely on uh, whether or not the uh, actions are in, uh, you know, in in line with what it is that this particular black politician wanted to do. Donald Trump speaks, I think to a lot of the conservative, culturally conservative uh, sentiments that are a character. We're a religious population more so than uh, the country as a whole. Um, the, the argument about immigration, Trump says, I want to have a border on the country. I want to be in control of who comes in. If they're going to be, they're going to love our country and have something to contribute, we welcome them. If they're going to be uh, a burden on our country, uh, we don't necessarily welcome them. I don't see why black people uh, should be uh, opposed to 
an idea of that sort, many would think that abortion is not especially welcome, uh, 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 public uh, uh, support for abortion is not especially welcome public posture. Um, they are, I think, many African Americans on the other side of the debates, the cultural debates that are dividing uh, the country right now between elites on the coast who are want to shut down uh, the economy in order to save the planet. Um, who think that the transgender rights is the at the forefront of the agenda of what human rights debate should be about, um, and so on? Who uh, you know? Uh, uh, so that I'm not at all surprised that Trump has seen growing support, although still a minority, of, amongst African Americans, because I think some of what he stands for resonates with some elements of the of black uh, history and culture here. <clears throat> the reason I mention as much as anything else is that it seems that the people who have the megaphones, particularly in the media and in academia, who are driving a lot of the debate at the moment, refuse to give us the whole picture. The whole picture about the African Americans who are doing well, uh, who don't share what are so-called, uh, what are now called progressive values, that, uh, that feel comfortable in the society that they're in. You never hear about that. And it just seems that without the complete picture, you fall victim to some of this language that's around, to come to a couple of terms that are bandied around with incredible abandon at the moment, uh, systemic racism and, right, and white privilege. And, and you yourself recently said, um, I think uh, along these lines, structural racism by contrast is a bluff. It's not an engagement with history. It's a bullying tactic. In, in effect, it's telling you to shut up. I thought those were very interesting observations. So you're saying that these are tactics designed to, say, fall into line with our perspective on the debate, don't enter into a wide-ranging, truly helicopter view of what's happening, good and bad. That, that's right. People say structural race, racism. Let me be specific. They look at the prisons. Uh, about 40% of the people incarcerated in the United States are black, and blacks are about 12% of the population. So that's a vast overrepresentation in the prisons. And they say structural racism, as if citing the overrepresentation of blacks amongst those who are held in prison proved that the system was racist, and not that blacks participated in criminal offending at a higher rate, were being apprehended as a consequence, and therefore were being represented in prison at a higher rate because they were more likely to commit criminal offenses. Now, the latter happens to be the case. That is to say, while there is certainly uh, some racial discrimination in American criminal justice, criminologists have looked high and low to try to find evidence that the disparity in prisons is due to racial discrimination, and they cannot demonstrate that because the disparity in criminal offending is itself off the charts, with blacks being uh, vastly overrepresented amongst those committing violent crimes. Now, you can call that structural racism if you want, but what I say to people who say that is, you're not trying to explain anything. This is a rhetorical yeah. move that you're making. You think by using those words, we're gonna change the subject from in the case at hand, the example that I'm giving, the criminal behavior of a relatively few black people, relatively few compared to a population of 40 million, the criminal behavior, you're going to change the subject from that to something about, and then you're going to start talking about the slavery and about uh, redlining and about, uh, you know, uh, anti-black uh, bias and whatnot, when in fact, what we really need to deal with, what we really need to confront as a society, sympathetically, uh, putting resources into it if necessary, is the foundations of the behavioral deviance which has produced this outcome. So we're not going to have an argument if when you people are talking about structural racism, about the behavior of the criminals, we're going to have an argument about the system. They want to blame the system for everything. That is both false as a social scientific matter. The causal arrows don't go in the directions that they're claiming. It's also devastating as a political matter, I argue, because just about everybody listening to this conversation knows that what you're saying is yep. BS. Yep. They know it's not true. They, they know, they know what's true. going on. Yeah. And you talk about those, those uh, you know, uh, disparities there in the numbers. Uh, what is it? 12% uh, of the population, 40% of the jail population. The other one that hits you in the face is Warren Farrell's point. Males are half the population of any given society, roughly. 
Uh, but 85% of the inmates in American jails, and I suspect it's much the same in Australia, are male. What is the boy crisis? What is the male crisis? No one talks about that. Uh, and again, it comes back, I think, to the issue of who is modelling appropriate behaviour to these boys as they grow up. Uh, but um, uh, just to come to a couple of other things that you've said that I find incredibly interesting, you recently said that you can live with disparities or you can live in totalitarianism. And I just, can I draw you out? Why do you think the project of removing disparities or bringing about equality between identity groups would lead or tend to lead us towards uh, totalitarianism? Taken to its logical extreme, I argue it would lead toward totalitarianism because I argue that groups actually are different in ways that inescapably produce inequality. Um, look at Asian immigrants' success in elite academic venues in the United States. Yep. Uh, there's a lawsuit now where Harvard is in court and a consortium of Asian American students are suing, saying that Harvard University, the greatest university in the country, is discriminating against them because only a quarter of the Harvard student body or so is of Asian American descent. And if they went by academic test scores, they would be half of the, I give the rough numbers, it may be off of by a percent or two. They'd be half of the student body. If you admit it strictly on academic merit, Asians would be twice as prevalent at Harvard and they would be half of the students at Harvard um, and as it is there about a quarter. So they're in court suing. Now, why is that? Why are there so many Jews who are at the forefront of various venues of intellectual competition in the United States? Why is that? Uh, genetic arguments are off the table, and I'm not making one here. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. That would be the last place that I would go. I, I, as a social scientist, I have to allow the evidence to determine my answer to that. But let me bracket the question of whether or not there are natural differences between human populations that are implicated in these disparities. There are huge cultural disparities between these populations. How the children are raised, what things are valued in the community, what aspirations are embraced, how hard do people work, how do they deal with their setbacks, what kind of resilience do they have, et cetera. Are they worried about disappointing their parents' expectations? Are the parents supervising their behavior in the household to ensure that they apply themselves in ways that maximize the chance of developing their talents? These things are vastly different between human population groups within the United States and I expect within any society. People who say that every disparity is an evidence of historical wrong are, are in effect um, ignoring the differences between these human populations that are reflected in their achievements. Um, so you can try to eliminate the achievement differences between these populations, but you can only do it by stifling and damping down and extirpating the behavioral patterns within the population groups that produce the differences in the first place. Uh, and when you do that, you're on a slippery slope to tyranny. You're saying the parents who want to spend half of their available income on their child development can't spend that much. They can't send the kid to a special school. They can't hire a tutor. You're saying kids who want to spend eight hours a day studying instead of four hours a day of studying somehow have to be limited from doing that. If you don't control the micro environment within which human development takes place so as to eliminate the differences in across the groups and the outcomes, you're not going to get rid of the disparities. So that's what, I mean, it's a theoretical point. I say if, in, if you insist on leveling so that all disparities are flattened and eliminated, what you're going to have at the end of the day is tyranny. Yeah, no, I take the point entirely, uh, and it's very well made. Thank you. Um, now, in June, you warned your fellow Americans in an article in, uh, in Quillette uh, that Americans are in a very dangerous situation now. We stand on the brink of a widespread epidemic of civil unrest whose ultimate consequences are difficult to reckon. That seems to me to be particularly pertinent, pertinent in the context of the upcoming presidential election you know, a deeply atomised America, it wouldn't take much for somebody in a moment of panic, you talked about the policeman approaching a car not knowing whether he's going to be hit or something, for a policeman or a figure of authority or someone in a moment of blind panic, um, 
is themselves blindsided, does something irresponsible, you've got a tinder box. It is dangerous, isn't it? And that's, that's worrying to all of us. What happens in America uh, goes well beyond America. Uh, it, it's a very concerning situation uh, here. That Quillette piece of mine had a title, something like uh, Denounce the Violence Without Equivocation. I can't remember exactly how they put it, but I was appealing uh, to fellow Americans that as the um, violence and the arson and the looting and the uh, murder and the assaults on police officers was unfolding in cities across the country, being celebrated uh, at some level by many progressives as the the uh, appropriate, the just comeuppance. Uh, people were saying things like, uh, what does it matter if they burn a building down or they take some property? It's only property. We're talking about lives here. Are you going to, if, if someone said law enforcement should prevent this uh, uh, disorder from happening, the response would be, well, law enforcement can't use the appropriate force in order to prevent the disorder because that would be putting uh, property ahead of lives. And I, I think that's just Madness. I mean, we're on a slippery slope here. The, I, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, the photographs that I, the images that I saw coming out of Chicago of North Michigan Avenue uh, high end boutiques being looted, and then Black Lives Matter spokesman saying, well, people are entitled to take it. They have to feed themselves after all. They're entitled to a reparation for the uh, racial uh, uh, injustice that they've had to endure, uh, and so on. It, it disturbed me deeply. Um, and of course, it's not only on the left of American politics that we have the potential and the reality of armed people who are prepared to go into the streets. Um, I think you're right to point to the prospect that this election that's coming, should it be close, should it not be decisively um, uh, determined as to who's the victor uh, on the night of the election? Should we uh, drag on for days or even weeks? Should we end up in court as we did in the year 2000 with the close election in Florida between George W. Bush and um, Albert Gore. Um, uh, we're now in the year 2020, not the year 2000. We have a different set of predicates that have been laid down from past behavior. We've had these George Floyd riots uh, in cities around the country. Uh, things could really easily, I think, get out of hand. Police officers are being assassinated here in the United States in real time. I mean, so that we had an incident not uh, more than a few days ago. Um, so um, I, I think it's, I don't know the answer, uh, but I do know that the danger is very real. One of the things that strikes me about this, Glenn, is that the 1960s civil rights movement was really a peaceful movement, strongly dominated, you know, strong, determined, focused, articulate uh, and widespread but dominated by the sort of Christian idea of turn the other cheek, don't break the law. You know, letter from prison from Martin Luther King advocating nonviolence, uh, obedience, um, peaceful protest. Uh, and it's as though that's been repudiated. In fact, my impression is that there are leaders in, in, in the current uh, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement who would actually say, no, we've moved on from that approach altogether. Uh, how does that play out, given that as you mentioned, African Americans are more likely to go to church than other Americans, uh, where they'll hear that doctrine all the time of being peaceful, of being loving, of seeking to turn the other cheek, uh, neither give insult nor, nor take insult. This whole movement seems to be born in a deep anger, and I wonder how on earth that can play out the right way. Anger seems to endanger everything now. Yeah, um, I, I don't know how it's going to play out, uh, but I do see the very different foundations on which the movement of the 50s and 60s rested relative to the uh, movement that we are uh, witnessing uh, today. Uh, and there was a Christian, uh, uh, not quite pacifism, but, but uh, a commitment to nonviolence, a belief in the goodness of the fundamental structures of the country. Mm. The uh, regime of discrimination and racism was taken to be a deviation from something. Martin Luther King and company were calling the country to higher ground. Yeah. They were saying to the country, this is not who you slash we are. I have a dream that one day my four little children will be judged by the content of their character. They'll walk hand in hand. 
black and white, and so on. Integration was supposed to be the goal, the idea that we wanted to become a part of America. Now, at the same time, or roughly the same time, there were other strands of African-American political expression, uh, Malcolm X and uh, the Black Power people, the Black Panthers, and so on, the male, the balled up fist, the angry shaking fist. There were people who said about the riots in America in the 1960s that started in Watts, Los Angeles in 1965, and that proliferated around the country in dozens of cities when, in that uh, summer of 1968 after King had been assassinated. There were people who were calling for the uprising. They wouldn't call them riots. They would call them uprisings, and they would imbue them with a certain nobility. So that was also a part of that era of a half century ago in terms of African-American political expression. And the thing that I think must be noted is that the effective legacy of the 1960s on contemporary African-American political expression is much more influenced by the, uh, the, the angry, uh, defiant, uh, violence-threatening uh, uh, behavior and attitude and outlook of the Black Power, uh, Black Panthers, uh, Black Muslim uh, radicals, much more influenced by it than it is by uh, the uh, Christian piety and pacifism of the, of the uh, conventional civil rights movement rooted in the church. They are iconic in American history, but they are, that is the church-based pacifist civil rights movement of King very much less influential than the radicals. Uh, you see that from the way in which the, uh, I think, from the way in which the athletes, the young, talented African-American athletes who are um, instant millionaires as soon as they finish high school, if they have the right kind of talent, the way in which they're reacting to this particular moment with the fist raised up and the Black Lives Matter uh, symbols and all the rest of a kind of defiance. And if someone comes along and says, well, wait a minute, America is a good and a great nation. Uh, America is a, has been a light unto the world. America defeated fascism on both uh, oceans uh, in the uh, middle of the 20s. America stood against the, the darkness of uh, Soviet communism uh, uh, with the threat of uh, nuclear extinction and faced them down. America is a beacon to the world. Everyone wants to have a representative democracy on the model that the Americans modeled at the end of the 18th century. Uh, and so on. If, if you say that to people, they sneer at you. Uh, America is not all of that. America, sitting on a hill, doesn't apply to us. Uh, popular writers characterize the American dream as a fraud, when the American dream is a light at the end of the tunnel for millions of people all over the planet. And it is the natural birthright of we Black Americans. And yet it is uh, dismissed as if it were a fraud. Uh, so the sensibility of contemporary activism uh, on behalf of African-American interests in the year 2020 is vastly different from uh, what characterized the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And I actually don't think it's progress. No, and you've got this sort of incredible self-loathing now uh, where um, leading white thinkers essentially argue that racism is about white supremacy and that whether you're conscious of it or not, if you're white, you are racist, and no one else is racist, which I find extraordinary. Um, uh, you know, you've got these best-selling books, um, White Fragility, yeah. How to Be an Anti-Racist, this critical race theory. How can that possibly help, that sort of approach? Uh, I, I don't know, and I, I'm not going to be able to explain it, actually. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit befuddled by it myself. You've got groups of white people kneeling down and begging forgiveness and so on. Uh, there seems to be a kind of moral panic, a kind of mass delusion uh, that has loosened the land. So it seems to me um, the, the essentialization of race, the, the use of race at every turn as the ex ex explanatory category that's going to help us understand what's going on in society. This is fostering racism, it seems to me. People think that they can constantly harp upon, we're going to be a majority, minority nation soon. Whites are going to be a minority. Whites are going to be a minority. They, they trumpet, they crow. Um, they talk about the black vote, the Latino vote, as if 
voting on black because of your race was somehow uh, a, a rational uh, approach to, to politics when my interests are extremely varied and uh, mostly haven't got anything to do with the color of my skin. Um, they think that they can play this, these race cards one after the other in one context or venue after another uh, and not provoke racial identity-based political mobilization on the other side. If whites are going to become a minority, if we got to get rid of whites, if whites are always guilty, if there is white supremacy at every uh, turn, what are whites supposed to do? Many white people, aren't they, going to start thinking about their interest in terms of themselves being white? And if you say to me, oh, they always thought that way, I would say, you know, as a matter of fact, they didn't. When you take an encounter between a police officer and a citizen, and you say nothing about it when the citizen is white and gets mistreated by the police officer, and you make a federal case out of it when the citizen who might be acting badly in the encounter gets uh, treated badly by the police officer, you're begging, it seems to me, for a reaction uh, from many whites, which is gonna be something that you, you, you really don't wanna see. Uh, so I don't know that George Floyd, and the incident was horrible, a man, laying on the ground, an officer seemingly indifferent with his knee on the man's neck, the man subsequently dies. That's bad, that's not good. That's not good policing, that's bad policing. I insist that, as far as I know, it was not a racial incident, which is to say, if I had changed the race of the man from being black to being white, it wouldn't have happened. I don't know that that's the case. I don't know that the police officer was acting in that circumstance based upon the race. These are things to be determined. Uh, the, the supposition that this is so um, it, it, it is, is extremely troubling to me. It seems to me that yeah, I, I take your point that fundamentally the problem here is that we're dividing, we're drawing a line between good and bad in all the wrong places. And in this case, we're drawing it between people of different skin color, whereas in reality, it's far more complex. If you take the horror of slavery, and a lot of these issues are traced back to the horrors of slavery, I think it's probably fair to say. Uh, one obvious point is, why are people not marching in the street about the fact that there's an estimated 45 million slaves in various parts of the world today? Uh, that's just almost an aside. But the history of slavery itself, horrendous as it is, tells you a great deal more. It tells you that the dividing line between good behaviour and bad behaviour uh, is... Uh, uh, is not between people of different coloured skin. As, as a fact, a black African-American pointed out to me the other day, the African slave trade involved Africans rounding up other slaves, other people, killing off the, the children and the old and the infirm and then selling those people. There's another aspect to it. Many white Americans took on the most horrendous and hateful war that perhaps uh, the world's ever really recorded. There have been wars that have killed more people but in terms of a civil war is so ugly, but that was largely about a lot of people in America deciding that slavery was a bad idea. Then you take the Royal Navy. When Britain abolished slavery in its own country in 1833, the most powerful nation on earth, it deployed the British Navy to make sure that nobody was slave trading on the high seas. And 17,000 white British sailors died securing freedom for people who would otherwise have been slaved of a different skin colour. So it's to draw the lines between good and bad on the basis of skin colour seems to me to be abhorrently racist and extremely dangerous. Well, yeah, but you're, this is a sacred um, kind of narrative and, and people will go ballistic. I mean, there are many points that could be made. Certainly, the fact that the uh, Europeans did not go into the interior of Angola or Congo or Nigeria and Ghana and dragoon millions of the people living there and bring them out of their hamlets all the way down to the coast and then put them on boats and carrying them across the Atlantic Ocean to the New World. They didn't do that. They couldn't have possibly done that. There was no possibility to produce that commerce and human chattel uh, without the profoundly deep involvement of people on the ground in these uh, places who were indigenous to those places and who were engaged in the, the, the you know, you bought a slave, you someone sold you the slave. Okay, so, they, so there's that fact. Um, the Civil War, 600,000 dead. 
uh, the 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 uh, incredible trauma. Um, now, people will say the war wasn't fought to end slavery. The war was fought to preserve the Union. Lincoln would have been happy to see the Union preserved even if slavery had persisted. I expect that that's correct, although he abhorred slavery. Uh, he was intent on, the, uh, on uh, preserving the Union. But the fact of the matter is that the consequence of that war was, the, in effect, with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution, which were enacted after uh, the war, to make the chattel, the descendants of the African slaves, citizens, citizens. Now, they weren't equal citizens. That's true. They were made into citizens of the country, and in the fullness of time, another 100 years, equal citizens. Should it have taken 100 years? No. no Should they have been no, enslaved in the first place? Yeah. With the benefit of retrospective hindsight? No, they ought not to have been. If you take my sensibility today and you import it back to 1800, they ought not to have been enslaved. But here's the thing. Slavery is a commonplace of human experience going back to antiquity. Emancipation, freedom for the slaves, the abolition of slavery, that's a new idea. That's a Western idea. That's an Enlightenment idea. That idea was actually brought to fruition here in the United States of America, liberating many hundreds of thousands of people and creating the foundation for the world that we now live in. It would not have been possible without the Western ideas uh, cultivated in the 17th and 18th centuries about the dignity of the human person and about the limitations of government, the legitimate uh, exercise of government power over other people, uh, wouldn't have been possible without those ideas. So something was created here. It was a horrible, horrible Holocaust out of which emerged something that I think actually advanced the, uh, the morality and the dignity of, of humankind. Uh, the abolition of slavery and the incorporation of African descended people into the uh, body politic of the United States of America was a world historic achievement. Well, you've been very generous with your time. I'm incredibly impressed by the way you've unpacked so many of these issues and the integrity with which you do it. And I've, I imagine courage, not easy to speak out against the common narrative. But can I ask you this from your perspective to, to round this out? Okay. Name two or three things, if you could, that you think can now be done to try and improve race relations, which really does matter. Put aside the causes, what's really happening, the false narratives, the false solutions. What should be done? What can be done, in your view? Yeah. Uh, I am a big advocate for opening up uh, the provision of educational services to people so as to allow for uh, competition with the public schools and increase the opportunity for poor people to get good education. I want to put choices in the hands of parents to seek out whatever provision of educational services best suits, suits their needs and let the chips fall where they may. So that's one thing that I would that I would point to. I, I think that um, integration intermarriage, miscegenation, miscegenation is the way they used to put it, um, mixing, uh, I think a ratcheting down of the intensity that we uh, invest, the investment, the intensity of the investment that we make in our racial identities, tamping that down, because that's not the most important feature of our human uh, you know, profile here. As Martin uh, Luther are, and King himself said. Character, Indeed. character. Uh, so so uh, I think a de-emphasis on race. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think the war on drugs has been a very, very bad mistake for the country. And I think some of the collateral damage, uh, it's not the only thing going on with the rise in imprisonment in the United States, but it's a major factor. Uh, it's no surprise that if you're going to have a black commerce in uh, narcotics, that it will flourish disproportionately in those communities which are most disadvantaged because those are the people who are gonna take the risk to do the kind of uh, activities that uh, the illegal commerce requires. Um, and uh, as a result, the overrepresentation of blacks in the drug trafficking <coughs> is part of what's going on in the uh, conflict of blacks and the police because the police are out there enforcing laws. And uh, you know, I, I incline toward a somewhat libertarian outlook on some things. I think uh, 
uh, the war on drugs has been has been a policy mistake. I think we desperately need better African American leadership, uh, more courageous uh, leadership, uh, and and uh, people who are prepared to um, you know step away from and stand up for, for example, stand up for what uh, they know to be right. So uh, this uh, um, you know demonization of the police officers, uh, the the you know. The, um, there are many, many black police officers who are beginning to speak out here uh, in the country now. Uh, this young, he's not a police officer, he's the uh, attorney general of the state of Kentucky, where a particular case, a woman who was shot in her home by a police raid when uh, the conflict broke out between her boyfriend and the police officers, the police officers fired bullets. Her name is Brianna Taylor. She's become a cause celeb here in the United States. Uh, the police officers were not indicted with uh, a criminal offense uh, for killing her on unfortunate circumstances, and that has led to much consternation. And the gentleman who is um, in charge of uh, the attorney general's office in the state of Kentucky happens to be African American, uh, and he's been trying to hew a very difficult line, and he's met with much vilification. But we need a hundred of him uh, to to. Uh, f foster a different account of what's going on and to uh, represent African Americans in a different way. Um, so those are some things I think of. Well, Glenn, thank you. You've unpacked uh, a, a great deal for us and uh, I know that'll be widely appreciated because the issues uh, that uh, America confronts in this area are also being confronted in Australia. Uh, and I'd, I would just close by making the observation that one of the patterns that we see here uh, that you've referred to is an under-recognition of just how many Indigenous Australians now have managed to break through the education system into the professions and are doing very well and for whom our society is working well. And that is not to downplay at all the plight of those who for whatever reason find themselves in a bog of misery and turmoil and despair but it is to say that unless you get the whole picture and unless you're honest and unless you go where the evidence demands that you ought to go, you'll only make the problem worse. So I, I deeply appreciate your uh, uh, insights uh, and your giving us the time to share them. I'm happy. You're welcome. I'm, I'm very happy to have um, had this conversation with you, John. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.